Hi everyone, Welm Chef's Travels. Today we are cooking another classic traditional dish all the way from Hungary. Yes, we're gonna knock up a Hungarian goulash uh, by popular demand. Um, so without further ado, let's get this show on the road. So the ingredients you're gonna need for this dish, I've got three onions, chopped and diced roughly. Um, some pl plain flour in a pan, a uh, reason it's in a pan I shall explain to you at a later stage. I've also got some self-raising flour in a bowl, which again we'll be going into later on. Uh, I've got two large chopped tomatoes here. I've got some four carrots, um, roughly cut, uh, chunky again, because I like it chunky. If you want to make them smaller, it's up to you, but remember they will disintegrate. Uh, two eggs. Four sticks of celery, uh, roughly cut up. Um, four potatoes, cut up. I put them in water at the moment, stop them going brown. Again, they are chunky and large because that's how I like them. If you want them smaller, it's up to you. I've got some fresh chopped garlic, some sweet paprika, some marjoram, some tomato puree, and some bay leaves. And over here, I'm using chin of beef today because I love the fat content in it. With a dish like this, where you're cooking it for about three hours, it's always good to have a good fat content because that breaks down um, and keeps the dish moist and keeps the meat moist. If you use a very lean meat, it's going to dry out and not have the same effect. And then some sour cream. Now, there are three um, items here that are essential to this dish. One is the sour cream, the second one is the marjoram and the third one is the sweet paprika. These three um, spices and etc are essential to this dish and make it what it is. I mean there's casseroles and stews all over the world but these three items make this classic dish exactly what it is. So without further ado let's get cooking. Good virgin olive oil in the pan And onions in. So those onions have round off a little bit now. I've got the stage we want them at. And what we're going to do now, put in our meat. Now as you can see, I've cut this up pretty large chunks, mainly because it's going to be cooking for a long time, so the meat is going to get smaller and it's going to disintegrate. If you want to cut it smaller, if grandma's coming round to dinner or something, if she wants smaller chunks, that's absolutely fine. I've done it this way because I do like my Hungarian goulash a little bit chunky, um, just the way I am. And as you can see, these lovely chunks of meat, that fat and glue is all going to break down and make a fantastic flavour within the dish later on. So the mixing, we basically just want to coat it a little bit. I don't want to sear it completely because I want the flavours to go into the meat and if you seal it, they're all going to be kept out and uh, basically I want all the flavours to be absorbed by the meat as it's cooking. So that's pretty much as much as you want to seal it off bit of seasoning in there. Fresh ground pepper, plenty of it. Love my fresh ground pepper. And this fish does tend to use a lot of ground pepper as well. It's part of the flavour. Um, there we go. So that's all coming on nicely. The next thing we want to do we pork tray all our herbs and spices. So everything goes in there. And give that another little stir. And I'll tell you what, the smell coming off this already is absolutely gorgeous. You know, I could actually sit down and just eat this as it is right now. 
So we're going to cook that off for about another five minutes, just to let the tomato sauce and tomato uh, puree cook off a little bit. This is basically a stew and a casserole. Um, it's going to be cooking for about another four hours. It doesn't generally matter how, much, how you put the ingredients in, because they're all going to emulgate in the end and become one happy family. So, at this stage, we'll put in my tomatoes. Give that a little bit of a stir. And as you can see, that is looking an absolute gorgeous red color already. And flavor's coming off it. Um, just out of this world. Next thing I'm going to do is put my celery in. Very important part of this dish, the celery. If you don't like celery, then don't put it in. But, you know, basically everything I've shown you to put into this dish, including the margarine and everything else, you can take things out if you want to. But basically if you do, you'll be changing the structure of the dish. But Cooking is all about making it how you like it. All I'm doing is showing you how you would make a traditional um, Hungarian goulash. So I want to cover it pretty much about a couple of inches over the top of, of the meat. Because um, as I say, it's going to be cooking. It's going to be cooking for about two hours. So for two hours you're going to lose a lot of moisture. So that goes on the back burner now. Basically, this is a Hungarian dish. Um, you can get all kinds of different casserole stews, uh, whatever you want to call them. The Africans have got one called poitikus, and which is pretty much the same thing. Mostly meat, of course, because it's South African. Um, and their philosophy is you can only stir it once. If you stir it twice, it becomes a stew and not a poitikus. For whatever reasons, I don't know, and I'm not going to ask. Um, but you've got different kinds of stews in different countries. You've got the French stew of Bourguignon, which is obviously um, the red wine and Mediterranean herbs like tarragon and oregano and all the usual things. Um, you've got the English cat classic stew, which is basically gravy and meat and vegetables. So they're all, every country has its own variation of a stew, but basically they all have a certain ingredient within them that makes them what they are and totally different to other cultures in other countries. And um, this one is of no difference. I mean, the main ingredients in this one that give it its flavor are the marjoram, the sweet paprika and the sour cream. I haven't gone into great detail as I say with these um, because it's basically simply uh, self-raising flour, eggs and salt made into a dough and then broken into little balls. Normally a lot smaller than this, but I like mine chunky and uh, these do actually complement this dish. Hungarian goulash goes with kaluskas. I'm not 100% sure how you say that kaluska, but if you want to look it up, uh, be my guest. So as you can see, our lovely kaluskas have been cooking away for about 25 minutes. They've pretty much tripled in size and I guess they're what we would call um, a relative of our dumplings, what we'd use in our stew. But anyway, without further ado, I'm going to take them out, Let's let them drain for a little while, and we'll come back to them when the time is right. So, as you can see, our Hungarian goulash is coming on an absolute treat. It's been boiling away now for about an hour, 45 minutes to two hours. It's still 
got a long way to go, but at this moment, what we're going to do is add our carrots and also drain the water off and add our potatoes. Now, the reason I'm putting these in at a later stage is because it's still got about another hour to go, another hour and a half to go probably, of slow cooking. With a good casserole or a good stew, as you know, the longer you leave it, the better and the more tender the meat's going to be. So what I'm going to do now is top it up. More water, because if you don't, it's going to dry out and you're going to end up with it sticking at the bottom of the pan. Bit of a winter dish. Um, really goes well with mashed potato. The reason we're cooking it today is because one of my lovely subscribers, Mr. Ian Argent, thank you very much for requesting that we do a Hungarian goulash. Um, Ian's a very good friend of mine, uh, worked with him as a chef for uh, quite a few years. So, big thumbs up for you for making that suggestion. As I say, if anyone else would like to make a suggestion, comment underneath and we'll see if we can knock up your favourite dish. So we've been boiling away now for another hour. Um, what we're going to do now is add our lovely little kalushkas, as they call them. I'm not going to put them all in because I've made too many. They have too many, they're not enough, in it? But basically that should be enough. And what I want them to do is like a Basically, like a dumpling, you know, a dumpling absorbs all those lovely juices. So within the next hour, that's what I'm going to leave that for another hour. I'm going to add a little bit more water. And let that simmer away for another hour. And then we'll come back and I shall take you through, take you through the final stages. Whilst I'm here, what I'd like to do, as usual, every week we have a question on Chef's Travels. Um, today we're not going to have a question, today we're actually having, well it is a question I suppose, but it's, I'd like your point of view on this. Feel free to leave comments below, um, subscribe if you'd be so kind, give me a cheeky little thumbs up, all appreciated. Today's question is, you go into a restaurant, you order your meal or a bar, and at the end you get your bill and it says 10% service charge automatically added. This is a total open discussion. I'm not gonna put any preferences in anyone's direction. What I'd like to know is, do you agree with that? Do you think that's fair? Or do you think that you should have a meal and decide at the end of your meal whether you should tip the waitress or waiter, whoever's been serving you for good service or not tip them for bad service? Um, totally up to you, I personally think. Um, but let me know your views on it. Oh, it'll be good to hear from people. Just comment below and again thanks to everyone who has subscribed to my channel so far everything helps me towards keeping this channel going um, bringing you some lovely recipes from all around the world so yeah basically that's the question for today is do you think you know you should pay a service charge uh, at the end of the meal or should it be at your discretion put my flour in a pan here because I want to use this at a later stage as a thickening but the problem is, when you use flour as a thickening, you get all that glutinous and that sort of stickiness that I don't really want. And the way to get over that is to basically cook your flour out. Um, you could make a roux, which is using margarine, um, but this way, I just basically all I want to do is cook out some of the gluten so that we get a much drier flour and. Uh, much better for thickening things up. And I'm going to mix this up with water later on. You don't want to colour it, just basically cook the, cook the gluten out um, and then mix it with water at a later stage and um, use it as a thickening agent. So this brings us to the final part of the cooking process. It's been boiling now for about, simmering away on the back stove for about three hours. And what I'm going to do now is earlier on I showed you 
my flour that I've been cooking, <coughs> my flour I've been cooking, for to dry it out. All I've done basically, mixed a bit of water with it, and I'm going to use that as a thickening agent. So I'm going to pour a little bit of that in there. However thick you want it, or how thin you want it, is up to you. If you want to leave it more like a soup, then that's absolutely fine. Totally up to you. I want mine with a little bit of body, so that's basically why I'm adding the flour and water now. A lot, a lot of people might say, well, why didn't you just put flour in the beginning and mix it with the meat and use that as a thickening agent? The reason being is because I'm cooking mine on the stove. If you were cooking it in the oven, that would be absolutely fine. But I'm cooking mine on the stove, and if you do that, what will happen, when it's cooking for about three hours, it will catch on the bottom. So basically, this is a method we use towards the end of it, um, because, it, again, it's, it's gonna stop it from sticking on the bottom and burning. Now for the final ingredient, and probably one of the more important ones, I'm gonna add some sour cream. Now this really complements this dish and makes it what it is, Hungarian, Hungarian goulash without sour cream um, wouldn't be a Hungarian goulash, it would probably be a casserole or a stew or something like that. But we're going to add some lovely sour cream, sour double cream. It's also going to give it a nice little bit of a colour turn. And as you can see, that, ladies and gentlemen, is my take on the fantastic traditional Hungarian goulash. This meat is just so tender, breaks away, so soft. Even grandma could chew it with her dentures in. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, proof to say is in the pudding. Paprika comes through, celery comes through all those ingredients emulgate into yet another classic traditional dish absolutely gorgeous totally recommend um, following this recipe and knocking this up especially on a cold winter's day in front of the telly a proper winter warmer my name's kevin anton thanks for joining me at chef's travels and hopefully see you on the next mission